after a blowout loss to begin this series on Thursday night, and really a last month or so of baseball that's been tough for the Orioles, they needed a little bit of a spark. And Jackson Holiday gave it to him earlier in the week, and then Kobe Mayo did so at least with his presence this weekend as he has called up for his big league debut, and the O's end up splitting the four game set with the Guardians. I'll recap the entire weekend coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, August 5th, 2024, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the final three games of the four-game set between the Orioles and the Guardians in Cleveland this weekend with the O's taking the final two on Saturday and Sunday to end up splitting the series and remaining in first place in the American League East. I'll recap all three games, the Friday loss, the Saturday win, the Sunday win, what went right, what went wrong, and a big shout-out to a couple of different Orioles this weekend. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use code all lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. So it's an Orioles series split, although if you just take into account the games that were played over the weekend, that's two out of three that I'm talking about. You always want to win two out of three, and that is what the Orioles have done since the last time that we talked. I mentioned this a couple of times in the podcast last week, still getting over being under the weather. The voice is a little iffy. Going to get through it, though. We're making it there, hopefully on the upswing. But the Orioles look on the upswing with the two wins Saturday and Sunday. Now, I recapped the a bit embarrassing Thursday night loss on Friday's episode, and they followed it up with another loss that didn't look too pretty, losing 8-4 to on Friday, but they turned it around, winning 7-4 to on Saturday, and then they took it 9-5 to on Sunday to split the series. Orioles with the 2-2 two and two weekend, now 67-46 and on the year. Now, as I speak, at about 5 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday, they are currently a half game up on the Yankees because the Yankees and Blue Jays are in a rain delay. That game is tied at three in the bottom of the eighth inning at Yankee Stadium. Those two teams have split the first two games of their series. This would be huge for the O's if the Jays could go in and somehow win two of three at Yankee Stadium. But even if the Yankees win and they have the same record, as I've mentioned, the Orioles have the tiebreaker right now, so they still will sit in first place in the division either way that game ends up. But let's start with Friday. We'll start with the one loss we are going to talk about on this episode. Guardians 8 and Orioles 4 in Game 2 of the series on Friday put the guards up 2-0 in this four-game set. Now, what went right from that one? Well, what went right was that Kobe Mayo made his major league debut. He was called up on Friday. I think we got the news late on Thursday night. I was already well done recording my episode. I was already very much in bed. There was not going to be an emergency episode, but Kobe Mayo, the Orioles' number three ranked prospect, coming up to the big leagues. And it's something we thought would happen as soon as Jordan Westberg went down, broke his hand last week out for an indefinite amount of time. Orioles just hoping Westberg returns before the end of the regular season. So you're probably looking at at least six weeks without Jordan Westberg. And you're thinking, okay, a third baseman goes down. One of our top prospects is a third baseman who is mashing in triple A and has been doing so for a while. It seemed like the easy move, but I talked about it on the pod last week and said, listen, the Orioles have one of two choices. They can either bring Kobe Mayo up pretty quickly here and just put him into this role, or they can worry about his defense at third base and worry about his rookie eligibility for 2025 and kind of just wait until September and then call him up as an extra bat. And while the Orioles did initially call up Levon Soto for one game, that seemed to be just to give Kobe a chance to collect his thoughts, get his feet together, play one more game in AAA. And then after Soto was on the roster for one day and did not appear in Thursday's game, Kobe Mayo gets the call before Friday. Now, Mayo had certainly earned that call up with his bat in AAA. He had been mashing the baseball as we've basically seen Kobe Mayo do at every single level in the minor league since the Orioles drafted him at a high school in the fourth round of that shortened 2020 draft out of Florida. He was committed to the University of Florida, but came to the O's instead. Now 22 years old, big right-handed hitter with massive power 
And in about 340 plate appearances in AAA this year, I mean, he was hitting over 300, 301, 375, 586. That's a 142 WRC plus with 20 home runs in Norfolk. And listen, 24% strikeout rate, not crazy high. And to go with a 10% walk rate in AAA, you're kind of liking what you're seeing. He was getting even better from the good stats he put up in AAA in 2023. The only question was his defense at third base, his foot movement has gotten better. His hands have gotten better. He's got crazy arm strength, but the arm accuracy has been a big issue for him, either throwing to second or throwing over to first. And that's been the thing that I think had held him up from not being in the big league sooner for the Orioles. But when you trade Mateo or when Mateo gets hurt, you trade Norby, Westberg gets hurt. You force your hand at this point to bring up Kobe Mayo. And I think it was a good time for him. Now, was he a little shaky at third base? Yeah, he was this weekend, but nothing disastrous at all. And he didn't come up with a hit. Now, he did walk twice in his first game Friday, which was awesome to see. He did strike out twice as well, but he went 3-2 against Emmanuel Classe and actually made him work. Maybe the best reliever in Major League Baseball right now. I mean, he had no for on Saturday, but he did rip a liner at 102 miles an hour. Sunday was his worst of the three. He went 0-4 with three strikeouts. That hit will come eventually. We've talked about it with these Orioles hitting prospects. There maybe has never been a larger gap between AAA and the Major Leagues in terms of the quality of pitching that you are facing. So it's becoming much, much harder to just kind of easily jump right into the flow in the major leagues and start producing. We're seeing it with Jackson Holiday. You might need a little more seasoning, but I don't think Mayo's going to you know, hit over 300 with 20 bombs the rest of the way, but they'll start to come. The swings have been pretty solid. You know, It's been a little tough on breaking stuff, chasing it out of the zone, but I still like how he looks up there. He looks like a big leaguer. That's the other thing with Kobe Mayo. Like He walks in the room, he looks like a big leaguer and only 22 years old, and it's just cool to see another one of these top prospects in the big leagues. Now we saw it a couple of times this weekend, even when he does start and it seems like Mayo, as he did, he started all three games this weekend since he came up at third base. He is going to start the lion's share of games at third, even though Ramon Arias was swinging a pretty hot bat before that. But Arias is going to come in defensively late in games when the Orioles are winning. We saw it twice in the wins on, on Saturday and Sunday. Although Arias is not anymore the gold glove level defender he was in 2022. He is still a good defender at third, is still a much better defender at third base than Mayo is. So if you have Arias on the roster, you got to utilize him, and that's how the O's are going to do it. So there may be cases where the O's blow a late lead, and then Mayo is no longer in the lineup, and you have Arias there, but you got to get the better defense. And the defense still concerns me a little bit for Mayo just with the throwing arm, but I think the bat will make up for that, hopefully, as time goes on and he gets this playing time. Now, what went wrong in that loss on Friday? Well, there's a couple things that went wrong, but I would pinpoint... Gregory Soto's Orioles debut. Yeah, not uh, not too great from uh, the big left-hander. Came over from the Phillies right before the deadline on Tuesday. Orioles sent pitching prospects Seth Johnson and Moises Chasse to Philadelphia. Soto, a former All-Star, 2021 and 22 with the Tigers, two All-Star teams, then was traded to the Phillies, was pretty good last year, has gotten a little worse this year, has kind of fallen out of favor, really no longer was a high-leverage arm, and because of that, Soto asked for a trade from the Phillies. He was upset he wasn't getting the high-leverage appearances, and his first appearance with the O's, certainly not high leverage. Orioles trailing 4-1 to one in the bottom of the sixth inning. More of a chance for him to just get his feet wet in an Orioles uniform, and it did not go well. He pitched just a third of an inning. He allowed four runs on three hits with two walks and no strikeouts on 30 pitches. He was just spraying the ball all over the place. That first outing was a disaster. Now, the stuff itself, like it's a 99-mile-per-hour sinker, it's a good slider, that looked good. The location was terrible. And he did improve. He got into the game in the sixth inning with the Orioles leading on Sunday and didn't allow a run. Looked much, 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 much better, even though he had a couple of hits. Much, much better in that Sunday outing than he did on Friday. So it's baby steps forward for Gregory Soto. He's going to be certainly better than he was Friday. Just kind of a, a rough start to his Orioles tenure. And then shout out on Friday to Dean Kramer. I know this wasn't the best start, especially as you look at the line. He goes five innings, four runs on six hits, two Ks, two walks, and 95 pitches for Kramer through five. But for the second straight start, he had run score against him that just should not have happened. I mean, you remember his start last Saturday against the Padres, the disaster defensively the Orioles put on, including that dropped pop-up. Kramer allowed four runs in that one over six innings, but struck out a lot of guys, and only one of the runs was earned. He actually pitched really, really well. I don't think he pitched as well in general in this start Friday night, but he thought he had a key out. Two on, two out. It is a, at this point, game that the Orioles are still sticking in on Friday night. They're trailing two to one, and he throws a good sinker to Josh Naylor, who pops it up down the third baseline, and 
Kobe Mayo just doesn't get there. Colton Kowser doesn't come in. They don't communicate. The ball somehow falls in between them for what should have been a, a pretty lazy pop-up. It becomes a two-run double that extends that lead for Cleveland. And it should have been five innings, two runs, and maybe Kramer, Kramer comes back out for the sixth if that ball is caught. It wasn't. I thought his his splitter looked pretty good. I thought he had good fastball command on both the fastball and the cutter. Really, these last couple of starts, listen, he's doing what a number five starter needs to do. And for the Orioles, when they're at their best, Dean Kramer is their number five starter, who you hope doesn't have to start a playoff game. And eventually, his defense is going to help him out a little bit more. And if he can just pitch like this, look at, in terms of the underlying stuff and what he's throwing up there, he will help the Orioles win games down the stretch. Unfortunately, they couldn't win the one. They had a little rally late in the game. Shout out to the O's offense. But losing 8-4 to four on Friday. So then kind of backs against the wall. Lost the first two of a four-game series against the team with the best record in baseball. How would the Orioles turn it around? Well, they'd turn around with some big offense and some great starting pitching to pick up a win on Saturday. And I'll tell you how they did it coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Liquid IV. When you're taking in America's pastime, don't forget to hydrate with Liquid IV's Popsicle Firecracker flavor, a surefire summer hit. Get hydrated with electrolytes, essential vitamins, and clinically tested nutrients from the number one powdered hydration brand in America. Because baseball and summer, well, they go together like Liquid IV and indulgent hydration. Some of the best parts about Liquid IV is that it can hydrate you faster, especially in a Baltimore summer. Like, it's getting close to 100 degrees and humid. We know about the humidity and how much worse that makes things here in Baltimore. Liquid IV can certainly help. And they've got amazing flavors as well. All you got to do is just tear it, pour it, live more. One stick plus 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone. And they've got all these amazing flavors, acai berry, lemon lime, pina colada, to make it taste good too. So no more thirsty summers when you indulge in hydration with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use code MLB at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code MLB at liquidiv.com. And today's episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast is also brought to you by the DK Law Group. When you need a law firm, do you want the legal runaround or would you rather have a no-nonsense approach? Well, you get the latter with the DK Law Group. The DK Law Group specializes in real estate law, estate planning, business law, and family law. They're tech savvy, they treat clients like family, and they focus on keeping your legal solutions simple. The DK Law Group is a women-led firm with Diana Khan at the helm. She's been called a legal expert in the field. So contact DK Law Group today at DKLawMD.com. And Locked On Orioles listeners can call today to schedule a free 30-minute consultation when you mention the tagline, Empowering Legacies. So the Orioles dropped the first two games of this series. Might have been feeling the pressure, but they turned things around on Saturday. Winning game three of the series, seven to four to make it a two to one faceoff in this four game set. Let's start with what went right in the Orioles seven to four win on Saturday. And that was, well, Jackson Holiday. And he has shown pretty much everyone that he is here and he is here to stay. Now he was recalled on Wednesday and pretty much immediately a grand slam for Holiday. Then Friday night, despite the loss, Jackson Holiday posts his first career two-hit game, going two for three with an RBI and a walk gets on base three times. What does he do to follow it up on Saturday? Almost the same exact thing. Two for four, a single, a double, an RBI for Jackson Holiday was hitting the ball hard all over the ballpark, roped a ball off the wall in left field, was pulling the ball into right field, hitting it into center. Everything he was doing was working, had a single at 105, had another hit at 100 off the bat on Friday that, that came off of Classe, which was pretty impressive. Then Saturday had a hard hit fly out in the third. The, the double in the fifth started the Orioles rally that gave him the lead, had an RBI single in the eighth. Right now, he looks like a completely different hitter than he did the first time he came to the bigs. And quite frankly, he looks like the hitter that was named for a long time and still is right now in most places the number one ranked prospect in Major League Baseball. And he's still showing that great plate discipline, but he is now driving the baseball. And it's almost like 36 plate appearances at age 20 
no matter how bad the struggles are, no matter how bad they look, should not define a player's career and should not make you think, oh, they need to trade this guy. He's going to be a bust. Yeah, Jackson Holiday is the real deal. Those who are watching knew, and I'm not saying that this week confirms that he is the real deal, but this is the player we saw throughout the minor leagues. To have this guy hitting ninth, I have a guess that as this season goes on, if he keeps this up, he's not going to be hitting ninth for long. But what he's doing at the bottom of this lineup is absurd. And then guess what? He did it again on Sunday. Another two-hit day, and he homered again, which we'll get to in a moment. But I mean, Jackson Holiday, just an absurd weekend. He ends up going two for four with that solo home run that he hit on Sunday, his second home run of his career, 97 off the bat, 362 feet on kind of an inside breaking ball from Gavin Williams that he just kind of forced over the right field wall. And since he has returned to the big leagues, not only did he have three multi-hit games this weekend in Cleveland, he is seven for 18 with two walks to five strikeouts. And he has put 13 balls in play since he returned to the big leagues. 11 of those 13 have been hard hit with an exit velocity of 95 miles per hour or more. That is absurd. Elite hitters, like elite hitters, hover around 50% hard hit rate. He is in an 85% hard hit rate since returning to the big leagues. It is quality of contact. Balls are falling in in big spots. This is Jackson Holiday. Again, he's not going to hit like this forever because it's impossible to sustain this kind of pace with hitting the ball hard, but it is special what we have watched him do since he was recalled. Now, what went wrong on Saturday? Well, not really much for the Orioles, but the Guardians' bats against Zach Eflin trying to square him up. That went very, very wrong for Cleveland. This is exactly why the Orioles went out and traded three prospects to Tampa Bay to get Zach Eflin because he can just go out and do something like this every single time he pitches. Six and a third innings, two runs, five hits, three Ks, a walk and a home run on 92 pitches into this game. Goes into the seventh inning looking strong. We know how much he hates to walk, guys. He walked only one, and that was right before the home run he gave up. Angel Martinez hit a two-run shot on a curveball in the third that put Cleveland up 2 nothing. Wasn't even a bad pitch. Like I think that pitch was even below the knees out of the strike zone, and that's Eflin's usually best breaking ball is his curveball. Now, they hit the sinker hard at times, but it was all on the ground, which led to a lot of outs. No one could square up that curveball or the cutter except for that one swing that led to the home run. I mean, that cutter, even though it was his third most used pitch on Saturday, that's looking like his top weapon. And he used it a good amount in Tampa, but the O's have had him weaponize it even more in his first two starts with Baltimore. That pitch is nasty. And listen, I've always loved watching Zach Eflin pitch, even when he was, you know, on the Rays or, or a little bit on the Phillies, but he was a reliever for chunks of that time, really when he was on the on the Rays last year and this year as well. He just hates walks. And again, it's one walk in two starts since joining the Orioles. And that's what you have to expect with this guy. It's a 2% walk rate this season for Eflin. He is absurd. It is so refreshing to go out there and watch somebody who just doesn't walk guys. And, and the same thing happens with Corbin Burns. And we'll get to his kind of struggling start on Sunday. But when you have two guys in your rotation of differing talent levels, Burns and Eflin, obviously, but that just don't walk guys and hate putting guys on base with free passes. It is refreshing to watch. And Eflin doesn't have the greatest stuff in the world. He's not going to strike out 10, 11, 12 guys, but he's going to be efficient, pitch deep in the games and not walk guys. And generally that's going to lead to good results. That is exactly what happened on Saturday. That's why I believe he was number two or three on my pitcher wish list for the Orioles at the deadline. This is why they went and got him. He has really helped out this rotation, even though it's just been two starts, has really helped out this rotation so far. And a shout-out on Saturday goes to the Orioles' new right-handed hitters. With no Jordan Westberg in this lineup with the injury, I thought Brandon Hyde might go back to Gunnar Henderson in the leadoff spot versus lefties. He hasn't been hitting leadoff for about a week now. But instead, Hyde went to Austin Slater. And we saw Slater and Aloy Jimenez in the Orioles' starting lineup for the first time. They'd come off the bench a bit in the previous couple of games. But we knew, and I talked about it on Friday's episode, hey, when the Orioles face left-handed starters, we're going to see these two guys. And they did in Joey Cantillo, the rookie left-hander making his second career start for Cleveland on Saturday night. And they went to Slater in left field, and they went to Jimenez as the DH. And it started with Austin Slater, who 
did struggle this year against lefties with the Giants and Reds, but really was just struggling overall with the bat this season. It was only like 100 plate appearances, not a high sample size. But if you go back in the past, he's been great against lefties. Last year, 288 average, 800 OPS against lefties. 2022, 277 average, 824 OPS versus lefties. 2021, in that amazing year with the Giants when they won 107 games, 284 average and 894 OPS against left-handed pitching for Austin Slater. Like this is a guy who's only 31 and throughout his career has hit lefties well. And the Orioles knew let's let's bet on that large sample size and not the very small sample size in 2024. And he delivered, had a leadoff double, ended up with two hits in this game, looked really good defensively in left field, runs bases well. That was helpful. And then we knew Eloy Jimenez would be DHing against left-handed pitchers. Now, it was interesting to see him also DH in the lineup against a righty on Sunday, and we'll get to how well he did in that one, too, in a little bit. But Jimenez came in there against the lefty. He was hitting 304 against lefties with the White Sox this season and came up with two big hits in that game as well. Like, Slater does great, two for three with a double. Jimenez does great, two for three with an RBI. And then... Brandon Hyde pulls the perfect strings in the eighth inning of this game because the Orioles, you know, had their rally in the fifth and they were holding on to a three to two lead heading into the eighth. And they put up a four run eighth inning against the best bullpen in baseball that the Guardians have out there to really put this game away. And it was Brandon Hyde pushing the perfect buttons. He put Adley Rutschman in there as a pinch hitter for Aloy Jimenez. And maybe John Kenzie Noel did help the Orioles by pulling a Verdugo and falling down in right field. But the two-run triple kind of broke this game open a little bit. Then he uses Ryan O'Hearn as a pinch hitter against a right-hander. O'Hearn delivers an RBI double to get another huge insurance run. Hyde just did a perfect job mixing and matching. And that's what Jimenez and especially Slater give you. Slater was used so many times as a pinch hitter against lefties in his time with the Giants, especially under Gabe Kapler when he was the manager there, that he's used to that spot. And we'll see that more and more. And we know how good O'Hearn has been as a pinch hitter the last couple of years. Like, I think this makes the Orioles lineup more balanced and more dangerous, especially late in games. And it was already one of the best lineups at coming back in baseball. They didn't come back in this one late, but they piled on late and were able to help hold on for that 7-4 to four victory with Cano getting the save and not Kimbrell to uh, get a win in the series. So then they went to Sunday and they were looking for the split and the split they got because they put up seven runs on 15 hits in Saturday's game. But how about nine runs on 15 hits on Sunday to secure the W tell you how they did it coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Prize Picks, America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. How do you play? Well, all you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. And if you've been watching Team USA, the last week, as I have, they have been amazing. They're racking up the gold medals. Well, you can make a prize picks lineup out of players across basketball, soccer, tennis, golf, whatever you want, and it takes just 60 seconds, and then you win money. So download the prize picks app today and use code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code locked on MLB on prize picks for a deposit match up to $100 at prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So the O's needed a big performance on Sunday as well to put together a split in this series, and that they did, winning it 9-5 to over Cleveland on Sunday to secure the split, and the O's are right back to one game behind the Guardians for the best record in the American League. Tell you how they won it first with what went right on Sunday, and that was just another complete offensive performance by the Orioles. In their last nine games, dating back to last Sunday when they beat the Padres to avoid the sweep, in that series at home at Camden Yards. The Orioles played nine games since then, and they are averaging 6.9 runs per game in that span. Remember when the Orioles were averaging five per game over the season? That was the best in baseball. They're almost up to seven per game. Those offensive struggles that they were going through, they are certainly breaking out of them right now. They've got about a 12% walk rate during that span, which is the highest in Major League Baseball since last Sunday. And they got a lot of guys just heating up. I mean, Gunnar Henderson stayed red hot on Sunday. He put together three more hits in a three for four day. He had a big, like, just laser line drive, two run homer 
in the Orioles three run fourth. He also drew a walk one of four that the Orioles had in this game as they continue to get more patient at the plate as well. And that home run for Gunner, it had been a while. That was his 29th home run of the season, but his first home run since July 14th. That was the final game before the All-Star break. That game where they beat the Yankees, the Verdugo game, that was the last time he homered. It hadn't been since before the All-Star break. And now Gunner in his last five games has just been absurd. 10 for 21 in his last five games with only three strikeouts. That's big because sometimes Henderson gets a little strikeout happy. And 14 of the 18 balls that Gunner has put in play have been hard hit. That is a 78% hard hit rate, which is absurd over that stretch. He is so locked in. And guess what? We haven't seen in the last couple of games also any of those defensive miscues that he was having for a little bit at shortstop. I think it's all coming back together for a guy who is certainly behind Aaron Judge and probably Bobby Witt Jr. as well now. But it's all coming back together for Gunnar Henderson. I mean, Aloy Jimenez, I thought like two hits on Saturday, like, thank you, we'll take it. Then he starts against the right-hander, which I was a little surprised by Sunday as Ryan Mountcastle was not in the starting lineup. And Aloy puts together three hits. He starts this game three for three as the DH for the Orioles. He goes three for five with a double, a couple of singles and an RBI, two hard hit balls. Jimenez casually five for eight since joining the Orioles. How about that? I mean, Aloy Jimenez, like, that's just his third three-hit game of the season. He only had two with the White Sox. His last one was June 30th. He had another one in April, and that was it. It's not hard to imagine that a guy with this much talent, who's been really good in the very recent past, still hits the ball very hard, right? And a guy who was playing on maybe the worst team ever was being berated by the fans. The media didn't like him. We saw that just because he was getting injured. You have to think a weight is lifted off Aloy Jimenez's shoulders, not only just coming to a new team, but coming to a first-place team. That can energize you. The O's can make a couple of tweaks. He can be a legitimate impact bat for the Orioles down the stretch. So far, so good for Aloy Jimenez. Colton Kowser, how about that? He reaches base three times in this one with a couple more hits, a double, a single. Or what what did he have, a double and a single? No, he he only had two singles. Sorry, Colton. But he did draw a walk as well. He scored three runs in this game. Kowser is now on a 17-game hitting streak. That is tied for the longest hitting streak ever by an Orioles rookie tying Trey Mancini's 17-game hitting streak in 2017. So all Kowser needs is a knock on Tuesday to set an all-time Orioles record. You got Adley Rutschman finally heating up again. He had two hits and three RBIs. He had the big two-run triple on Saturday, had a big-time double off the wall for an RBI on Sunday. It was his first multi-hit game since July 9th, almost been a month since that. I mean, Adley was really slumping. He hit just 132 in the month of July, but these at-bats, even though he didn't have a ton of hits in this four-game series. The at-bats looked way more comfortable. The quality of contact was much better. He's on a little three-game hitting streak. He is pulling out of it. I mentioned Jackson Holiday made it three straight multi-hit games. He had a big day. And then Brandon Hyde pushing the right buttons again, pinch hitting with Ryan Mountcastle in the sixth inning when the nasty lefty Tim Heron was set to face Ryan O'Hearn in a really big spot. It was first and third, two outs. O's were clinging to a 6-5 lead, trying to extend it. And he Brings in Mountcastle, and Mountcastle delivers pinch hit RBI single to get a huge insurance run in the sixth. And it's like everybody just kept contributing back to back games with 15 hits for this Orioles order. Like up and down the lineup, they got it done in this one once again. And they are turning back into that offense that is fun to watch, but they're almost at another level right now because they're walking a little bit too. They're hitting slightly less homers, but gathering more hits in general. And they are super dangerous once again. Now, what went wrong on Sunday? Well, it was, you could say, Corbin Burns' worst start of the year. He allowed five runs in this one, the most he's allowed all season. Now, only four of them were earned. Five runs, four earned, seven hits over five innings with four Ks, a walk, and a homer on 92 pitches. Now, it's not like he got slammed. The Guardians only had four hard hit balls against him in five innings. It was a little bit of bad luck. Now, the unearned run that scored in the third was on his error, and I am a believer that if a pitcher makes an error, that run should still be charged to him in terms of an earned run. It is not at this point, but he kind of made a bad decision and threw a ball away at first base to allow a run to score. But really for Corbin Burns, it was it was kind of shocking to see him only pitch five innings. And it was the right decision for Brandon Hyde to take him out at that point in a 6-5 game. He was kind of laboring through that fifth. I mean, you're looking through his game log and you're like, when's the last time Corbin Burns didn't complete six innings? April 20th against the Kansas City Royals when he allowed three runs over five and two thirds. Only the fourth time all year that Burns has not completed six innings. 
and it was his worst start. And still he kept the O's in the game. And really he was in that spot where he was in the bottom of the fifth. The O's were up six to two. There were two outs. He got 0 and two on Jose Ramirez and he throws like a great breaking ball almost in the dirt. And Ramirez somehow gets a bat on it because this dude is legit and probably a future Hall of Famer. And hopefully he wins an MVP someday because that's one of the best players in Major League Baseball that doesn't get talked about enough. Hits this like little squibber down the third baseline. It was going to be a really tough play for Kobe Mayo anyway. He booted it a little bit, but not an error. That that was a play that even Jordan Westberg I don't think makes. And somehow turns that pitch into an infield single. And then you get Josh Naylor to the plate. Burns loses his command a little bit, goes 2-0, and and just throws a bad changeup. Hangs it right down the middle. Naylor hits a lot of homers, crushes a three-run shot. And all of a sudden, it's a 6-5 game. Now, Burns did get the next out to finish five and keep the Orioles in the lead. But you can tell just not his overall best stuff. Only had eight whiffs. Really wasn't missing bats in this game either. But you look at what he's done all year, and he still has completed five in every single start. And again, I think it was 17 or 18 consecutive starts of six innings until this one. So yeah, you'll give him a break. Like he was one little bad luck pitch away from giving up two runs in five and probably coming back out for the six and having a chance to complete six innings. Baseball, a game of inches. We saw that on Sunday. And the shout out goes to the bullpen combo behind Corbin Burns. Because Brandon Hyde mixed and matched. You don't plan for Corbin Burns only giving you five innings. But when he did... Hyde went out there to his bullpen and used five different relievers to cover four scoreless innings for the Orioles. They allowed only three hits out of that pen. They only struck out two and they did walk two, but zero runs on the board is the important thing. Gregory Soto got two outs, looked much better than his Orioles debut on Friday. Birch Smith got two big outs. CNL Perez, two huge outs. Inyar Cano looked good in the eighth. Sir Anthony Dominguez was a four-run lead, so not a save chance. Even though Craig Kimbrell was warming alongside Dominguez in the top of the ninth, it was Dominguez who came up and put up another zero to close out the win on Sunday. Just a really good bullpen management, really good bullpen production from those five guys. And the Orioles win it 9-5. to five. And hey, didn't start off so well. Those games weren't great on Thursday and Friday, but they played great baseball Saturday, played even better baseball Sunday. And the Orioles go on the road against the team with the best record in the American League, and they split the series and remain in first place in the AL East. And they get rewarded with a day off on Monday as the Orioles will go from Cleveland and they will head north of the border. They won't play on Monday, but they will be back in action on Tuesday against the Blue Jays. But even though the Orioles are off, that doesn't mean this podcast is off. We are still back with another new episode coming up tomorrow. And you know what I realized? We haven't really opened up the mailbag in a little bit. There's been a lot going on. We had the draft. We had the trade deadline. We had the all-star break. It's always busy in July. So let's kind of do a little Orioles reset mailbag here in August. You can send your Locked on Orioles mailbag questions via email to LockedOnOrioles at gmail.com. You can please leave them in the YouTube comments right here on the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe as well. You can send them on Twitter at Locked on Orioles. That is the least likely place for me to see them. But email and in the YouTube comments and uh, we'll Unless we get some Orioles news, of course, we will open up the mailbag on tomorrow's episode. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.